Last Sunday, we started a discipleship sermon series titled, The Tree of Life, Growing Disciples. And Pastor Jim presented us with a picture or a graphic that helps us to be able to reimagine discipleship. It should be on the screen here. This image of a tree depicts our visible growth as well as the invisible or hidden root system that is required for us to be able to survive and thrive as disciples of Jesus. Jesus has planted the seed of the gospel into our hearts, and over time, if we have surrendered our lives to Christ, the Spirit will produce kingdom fruit in our lives. Pastor Jim also mentioned that we're going to spend the majority of the summer unpacking eight core qualities of discipleship from this book that we have taken it from, some would say stolen it from, Dana Allen's book called Simple Discipleship. And we do have a limited supply if you're interested in picking up a copy of that book today for $10 or you can go on Amazon and purchase it off there if you'd like. Not a requirement, but if you're interested. Today, I'm going to share about the first core quality with you, that is gospel saturation. The definition of saturation is having or holding as much as can be absorbed by something. Consider saturation for a moment in relationship to color. Color saturation describes the intensity or the purity of a particular hue. When a given color is fully saturated, the color is considered in its purest or truest or brightest version. Someone who lives a gospel-saturated life then is a person whose life embodies that which is true. Pure, radiant, one who boldly and brightly shines the light of Christ in a hurting culture. Saturation is is also and predominantly associated with water. When something such as a sponge becomes saturated with water, it's soaking wet, sopping, drenched. The best picture of gospel saturation that I can think of is immersion baptism. When we fully immerse a person and they come out of the water excitedly dripping from head to toe. This is often done for new believers, but the image provides us with a visual depiction of what a gospel-saturated life is like. Someone who has been reborn in Christ. Someone who lives a gospel-saturated life, therefore, is someone whose whole life, inside and out, is dripping or overflowing with the good news of Jesus. Or consider a plant that has been planted into the soil and the soil has been saturated by a heavy thunderstorm. The entire plant is affected, both what is visible above ground and what is invisible or hidden under the ground, both the sprout and the roots. Speaking of thunderstorms, Hopefully your basement hasn't been saturated or drenched by all the rain that we received this spring. As I say that, many of you are starting to have nightmares and flashbacks. No, make it stop. No more rain. No more basement leaking. My dad is getting ready to put my grandpa's house on the market. And the same day, uh, actually within half an hour of the new carpet and pad that were installed in the basement, we had one of our signature Midwest thunderstorms, and his whole basement flooded for the first time since we could remember. (laughs) Those of you that are chuckling under your breath are only laughing because it, it wasn't you that it happened to, right? The point, though, is that it rained so hard that even the foundation of the house could not contain the water, so it began to overflow into the home. The house became flooded, just like when the Holy Spirit floods our hearts with living water. The gospel begins to seep into other areas of our lives, areas that we had built up walls around. Yes, this is what happens when our lives become saturated with the good news of Jesus. Finally, consider a seed. Seeds can't become mature plants or trees unless they receive water. So, in a similar way, when a gospel seed is sown, it must be watered or saturated before it can grow or become mature. 
And this watering doesn't just happen once or twice. It happens over and over again, frequently, over a period of time. So gospel saturation, you could argue, is less of a quality, per se, and more of a state of being, a lifestyle of loving God and loving others. It incorporates all the other core qualities of being a disciple, including those related to the heart, the head, and the hands. In his book, Simple Discipleship, Allen defines gospel saturation this way. He says, a gospel-saturated life is the extent to which a person's identity and actions are motivated by who they are in Christ. Gospel-saturated Christians are mature believers, disciple-makers, those whose identity and actions are fully surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. They are greatest commandment Christians who genuinely do love God and love their neighbors as themselves. These mature believers aren't perfect, except for Pastor Bob, of course. But they are actively abiding with Christ. When I speak of living a a gospel-saturated life, what I'm referring to are, are those whose identity and actions are rooted in the vine. If you would, let's stand together and read together Jesus' words in John 15, 1 through 5. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Thank you. Please be seated. This passage in John 15 happens to include the last of the famous I am statements that Jesus makes in his fourth gospel, which declare in no uncertain terms that Jesus is God. Jesus speaks to his 12 disciples and to us about the significance of abiding or remaining in the true vine. He incorporates a a metaphor of vine and branches and fruit or grapes to help us recognize our life-giving dependence on God. In other words, Jesus is challenging his disciples to live gospel-saturated lives. In verse 1, he begins this garden metaphor by referring to himself as the vine. He's probably thinking of a grapevine, perhaps even the, the large, elegant, golden grapevine that adorned the entrance to the Jerusalem temple. When the first century Jewish audience would have heard Jesus pronounce himself as the true vine, they would have immediately been reminded of some Old Testament scripture passages that refer to the vine as the nation of Israel, such as Psalm 80, which says, You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Its branches reached as far as the sea. Its shoots as far as the sea. As the river, why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the field feast on it. Watch over this vine, and root your right hand has planted. The sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. Here the psalmist cries out to God to restore the nation of Israel, comparing her to a vine. God brought this vine out of Egypt and planted it in the promised land, but her fruit has been ravaged by wild animals. So the vine needs restoration in order to produce healthy fruit that God can use for his intended purpose. Interestingly, the the psalmist also mentions the son whom the father has raised up for himself, foreshadowing 
the life of Jesus, the true vine. Another passage depicting Israel as a vine is found in the Song of the Vineyard, which you'll see on your screen, Isaiah 5, 3 and 4 and following. It says, Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for grapes, why did it yield only bad? The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he has delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Again, you can see that the vine was a common symbol for Israel, God's chosen people. The scripture specifically states that the vineyard of the Lord is the nation of Israel. God is portrayed as a gardener, a grape grower, the vineyard owner. And the fruit of Israel was compromised, yielding only bad grapes. In both of these examples from Psalm 80 and from Isaiah 5, this vine didn't produce the kind of fruit that God desires. It was either rotten or ravaged because of unfaithfulness, unrighteousness, or oppression. In fact, due to the lack of good fruit and the abundance of bad fruit, the vine needed to be rebuked because the day of judgment was coming. It's with this context in mind that, in a way, it's rather shocking that Jesus would refer to himself as the vine. Because the previous vine, known as Israel, was associated with bad fruit. But on the other hand, if Jesus was in fact the true vine, as he claims that he is, then he will come to fulfill the purpose of the original vine, that is Israel. To be sure, Jesus is juxtaposing the fruitless nation of Israel with himself as the one to whom Israel points, the one capable of producing an abundance of good and healthy fruit. After referring to himself as the vine, Jesus then speaks of the father as the vine dresser or the master gardener, affirming the language that we read in Isaiah 5. A more literal translation speaks of the father as a a farmer, the owner of the property who is responsible for seeding and cultivating the land, for tending to the field, watering the soil, harvesting crops, and pruning branches. So in this gospel metaphor in John 15, the Father is the master gardener, Jesus is the true vine, and you and I are the fruit-bearing branches. As branches, we can only derive our life from the vine, and the vine produces its fruit through us. All of the fruit of God's ministry continues to be produced through us, his church. It's an amazing and astonishing reality and responsibility that Jesus has chosen to reveal his kingdom fruit through your life and mine. However, you should be warned because being a branch comes at a cost. Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the gardener, removes. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So one of the father's jobs is, as the gardener is to prune the fruit-bearing branches and cut off the fruitless ones. Either way, it's going to hurt. So we need to be prepared to get pruned. After all, pruning is essential to growing and producing more good fruit. In fact, if we remain connected to the vine, God will use the pain and affliction we have experienced from pruning to produce more fruit and better fruit in the future. Speaking of pruning, this word translated to prune in verse 2 could also mean to clean or to purify. The same root word is found a verse later in verse 3 when Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. In other places, this same word could be translated to sanctify. 
So Jesus claims that his disciples are already clean and they also need to be cleaned again and again in the form of pruning. For the Christian, then, we are initially purified or washed or sanctified by Christ's blood. And we are also continually being purified, washed, and sanctified day by day by the power of the Holy Spirit in repentance. We are both cleansed and being cleansed, washed and being washed, sanctified and being sanctified. This is what it means. For the Christian then, although the disciples were already clean, they still need to be pruned to bear more fruit. Jesus' reference as to his disciples as branches begs the question for us, do our lives bear fruit? The sobering truth is that a Christian is not a Christian at all without some measure of fruit. So I want you just to close your eyes for a moment and envision the person in your life that you know that bears the most fruit. I think we can all agree that the person we're thinking of is Bob Leilightner, <laughs> who has done more than 500 weddings and probably that many or more funerals. Why does everyone want Bob to do their wedding or their funeral or both? Because whoever Bob comes in contact with, that person is the most important person in the room. And he lives a gospel-saturated life. Also, when I say that our lives must bear fruit, I don't just mean our individual lives, although, of course, that's important for each of us to bear fruit individually. But Jesus wasn't primarily addressing each individual disciple. He was addressing the group. The you is plural. So the question is not just does your individual life bear fruit, but do we as a corporate body of believers called colonial bear fruit, all of us together? And what kind of fruit do we bear? Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit, healthy or unhealthy? This is a challenging question, but it's one that we all must wrestle with as we assess how our discipleship journey is going in our individual lives, in our families, and in our church family. Also keep in mind that Jesus is sharing this message to his disciples, one of whom, Judas, would go on to betray him. It's a sobering reality, and it means that not everyone who goes to church on Sundays or attends a Sunday school class or spends time reading their Bible will automatically bear good fruit. You can do all the religious acts in the world and still cease to have a gospel-saturated identity. So to bear fruit, we need to learn how to abide, to remain in Christ, the true vine. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to keep in mind that this word abide is a verb. It's an action word. It's not about being passive spectators, but active participators. In his book, Union with Christ, Rankin Wilborn, he compares abiding to sailing. Has anyone sailed before? I have not, but someone in the first service had. Sailing, it's not, it's not like just floating down the lazy river on an inflatable raft where you do nothing but relax. Nor is it like driving a, a motorboat in which you rely on the power of the motor to do all the work. Instead, abiding is similar to sailing on a sailboat. While you can't control the power of the wind, you can actively seek to catch it. And the more you practice, the more skilled you become at it. And the more skilled you become, the more fruitful the experience will be. D.A. Carson in his commentary on John says this about abiding in Christ. He says, it is organic growth, internal growth, driven by the pulsating life of the vine and the branch. And only this kind of growth produces fruit. The imagery of the vine is stretched a little when 
The branches are given the responsibility to remain in the vine. But the point is clear. Continuous dependence on the vine. Constant reliance upon him. And persistent spiritual imbibing of his life. This is the sine qua non of spiritual fruitfulness. I love this quote. Because I get to say sine qua non. (laughs) Even though I have no clue what that means. The crucial question, though, is not if we should remain in Christ, but how. How do we remain in Christ? What does abiding in Christ look like for us today? According to Alan, there are two main characteristics of a gospel-saturated Christian. There's a gospel-centered identity and gospel-centered actions. Gospel identity is the extent to which an individual bases their identity upon who they are in Jesus and what he has done for them. Simply put, your identity is who you are. What defines you? Is your identity defined by Jesus or by something else? In his book, Who Do You Think You Are?, Mark Driscoll says that Christians struggle with what he calls identity idolatry. That is, we are constantly tempted to place our identity not in our creator, but in created things. Timothy Keller calls these things counterfeit gods. Kyle Eidelman calls them gods at war. You see, we commit the sin of idolatry when good things become ultimate things. And when we obsess over these things, they become or overtake our identity. Using John 15 language, idols can be thought of as counterfeit vines. If you fully devote yourselves to them, They will not only disappoint you, but they will not produce kingdom fruit. So which vine do you abide in? The true vine or another vine? Truth be told, whichever vine that you abide in is your God. Whatever your heart desires most is where your identity lies. Practically speaking, before we can, our identity can be established or reestablished in Jesus, we need to do a couple of things. First, recognize our idols and repent of them. And second, believe God's word concerning our true identity. Another way to recognize your identity is to ask yourself, where does my life's value or worth come from? Does my value come from my achievements, my marriage? Does my life's worth come from my kids or my friends, from my bank account or my comfort? Does it come from food or My job, does my value come from success or safety, education or whatever zip code I live in, romance or love, competence or popularity? Does my value come from playing sports or my favorite sports team? Does it come from entertainment or sex or working out? Where does my value come from? Others believe that their value is rooted in their suffering. If you're dealing with feelings of shame or guilt resulting from trauma or loss or abuse or rejection or suffering of any kind. If you have ever felt devalued or worthless due to trauma, pain, oppression or injustice at the hands of another. Know this. That Jesus sees it. He empathizes it with it. He has compassion for it and he died to redeem it. Amen. The truth is that your actual value or your worth is not defined by what others think about you or by the pain that they may have caused you. It is defined by the fact that you are in Christ. Your true gospel identity is based in the one who loves you fully and unconditionally. Dana Allen says, he says, when God looks at me, he doesn't just see a man whose sins are washed away. He sees the credentials and the righteousness of Christ laid upon me. And if God looks at me and sees the righteousness of Christ, then I must ask myself, what could I possibly do to add to my resume on top of the credentials of Jesus? The best way to combat these lies of of worthlessness or insignificance is to belong to a biblical community, a church that helps saturate you in scriptural truth. 
There are so many incredible verses that speak to our gospel identity. Here are a few. John 1, 12 says this, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Galatians 4, 4 through 6, God sent forth his son so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. These verses and others like it all say a similar thing. They say because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, our true identity is as his adopted sons and daughters. Amen. To recap, mature, gospel-saturated believers base their identity in who they are in Christ as God's adopted children. Lastly, mature believers who live a gospel-saturated life have gospel-centered actions. Gospel actions are the extent to which A disciple's actions are motivated by who they are in Christ. Gospel actions are the visible fruit that come from being connected to the vine. Actions are crucial for without faith, works is dead. But be careful because God is not just looking at your actions. He's also looking into your heart to examine your motives. Are they pure? Do you serve to be seen or do you serve in secret? Do you give so others will see or do you give anonymously? Do you say yes out of guilt or do you say yes out of gratitude? What are the motives behind your actions? Are your actions motivated by who you are in Christ? Our motives are part of that hidden root system of the tree of life as we grow as disciples which we'll continue to elaborate on in in future weeks. But in closing, know this, that living gospel-saturated lives means rooting our identity and actions in the crucified and resurrected Jesus, who is the true vine, the tree of life. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we are so thankful that as the true vine that you have allowed us the opportunity to gain our life from you. God, we pray that we would continually trust and obey, that we would be actively connected to that vine so that we could bear kingdom fruit, not for our glory, but unto your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.